Some of this stuff rather quickly because either uh, Newton or Rick have already gone over some of it. Um, on phys age, I guess one of the key things I wanted to just have people think about was very much de depends on what variety you're growing on, on how you want to manage physiological age. And it, there's varieties that we, over the years, we, we, it, it seems to be of our benefit to keep them a bit younger because they already have a lot of stems and they already have a big tuber set. And you don't want to go overboard on tuber set because you're worried about size and you want to make sure you don't have too many smalls. Conversely, we have varieties like Prospect and Dakotas where we struggle with tuber numbers and we all we usually have lots of 10 ounce and we're trying to get the size up. And I know like for people that are growing chip varieties, they don't want them great big honking tubers anymore. They want to have that profile a little bit smaller. So it, variety by variety, we have to maybe manage these a little bit differently. From, we've done some main research over the last number of years and what we found is that for Russet Burbanks, um, keeping that seed refrigerated longer uh, led to improved size and improved marketable yield. And that was pretty consistent year over year. Um, we also, in the last year we did this work, we also saw maybe some benefit towards Alverstone Russets. Again, a variety, generally lots of tubers, and we're trying to get them lengthened out a little bit. Eh? Newton, we're yep. trying to get a little more size yep. on them. So that's our argument for the reefer unit, you know, in those situations. But you may not want the reefer unit in some of these other varieties if you got Dakotas and you got, you know, Prospects and you got Matt with Gems and some of these other ones where, you know, you want to get a little, few more stems, a few more tuber numbers because that's going to help drive your yield and they don't have that same problem with size. So just something to kind of keep an eye on. One of the big things we've been working on is how do we build a size profile that enables the seed producer to still make money because as Newton said, we're still selling seed by the hundredweight. How does the seed producer still make money, as much or more money, um, but how do we have a seed profile that requires less cutting? How do we have more whole and single cut seed pieces instead of lots of you know double cut and triple cut stuff, right? Because the more we cut, the more wastage we're gonna have, generally the more the decline in seed vigor. Um, Newton was able to show some of that in some of, for some of his varieties. It's not overall varieties, but particularly on some varieties. So we've kind of played with a few different things on some trials with you guys uh, in terms of how do we how do we play around with this a little bit. Um, when we look at whole seed and or whole seed grown to be fur seed, um, we've generally seen the same or better yield with whole seed as opposed to cut seed. But we all almost always see more smalls and fewer 10 outs. So that again is gonna be a factor of spacing. So generally we've seen as you have more whole seed and larger <coughs> seed pieces, you have to increase your spacing a little bit to help compensate for that. Especially for certain varieties, Russell Burbank particularly. Probably less so for Mountain Gems and some of the other varieties, but for Russell Burbank particularly, you really need to pay attention to the spacing when you're using whole seed or bigger seed pieces. And we generally saw the larger whole seed performed better uh, for yield and crop value than the smaller whole seed or the cut seed. Um, I kind of just said most of that. Um, one of the benefits of whole seed is that, you know, if you have the ability of sizing it out of your seed uh, lot that you get and you can plant it separately, again, taking into effect those, you know, in row spacings and that sort of thing, if you can plant that out separately, that you can usually plant that whole seed earlier. So that could enable you to, you know, lengthen your planting window a little bit because if it sits in the ground for another uh, extra couple of days, it's much less likely to have issues with rot and disease issues and emergence issues than cut seed. So, uh, so that is a uh, that's an opportunity that comes with whole seed that you know not with cut. Also, looking at reduced nitrogen, we've done I don't know five or six trials over four years on. Uh, reduced nitrogen in seed and we've generally always seen a very much the same uh, trend which is we see really statistically no difference in yield by reducing nitrogen and in some cases uh, not every case but in some cases we've seen a slight increase in specific gravity where we have the reduced nitrogen and in some cases we see a little we see an increase 
or we see a uh, improvement in the size profile. So you can see in this field with Burbanks, we had 30 more hundredweight in what we call this prime category, which is like the one and a half to seven ounce category, right? So we had more shifted to this category, even though, uh, and we had a larger total yield. On the Shepherdies, again, we had more in the prime seed category, even though we lost, uh, we were a little bit lower numerically on the total yield. But you can see that shift is all in the top end, all in the stuff which maybe is the stuff you don't want to cut for seed anyway, the really big stuff, right? That's got to be double cut and triple cut. So um, again, not really seeing a penalty by, in this case, decreasing nitrogen by 40 pounds <coughs> an acre for Burbanks and 20 pounds an acre for Shepherds. We did that again this year. Uh, this were, these were two fields up west, so Dakotas and Alverstones. The, his starting rate was 100 pounds, so it was already kind of on the low end for nitrogen on seed. Uh, decreased another 20%. This is following, there was alfalfa in this field the year before, or alfalfa grass, I guess. So yes, there would be a nitrogen credit coming from that field as well. But started with, a, I would say, a low-ish number for nitrogen. And again, there's a little bit more tu uh, tubers. There's about a, f you know, seven eight percent increase in tubers uh, per per plot that we saw here. Um, the yield difference is probably not statistically significant, but we again, there's no penalty here by going up. And the same with these Alverstones. Again, eighty pounds of nitrogen on Alverstones at almost four hundred hundredweight total yield. Like that's pretty impressive, right? Now I know it rained up west, but um, still, that's pretty good. And we saw an interesting little tidbit here. This is not statistically significant either, but um, we saw a few of these trials where the gravity trended up a little bit as the nitrogen went down. Then on, this was uh, central PEI. The, you can see the starting rate's higher here. We're starting at 177, which is closer to a commercial rate. Um, this field was irrigated and did not have a leg in the year before, so no nitrogen credit coming in. But again, back in the nitrogen off 20% 20, 20%, so 23 pounds, no difference. No difference in yield, no difference in quality. Um, probably, uh, if we were able to back this off to 120, um, I still don't know that we'd see a big difference in yield, but we might start seeing some of the difference in tuber number that we're kind of looking for. But this tells me that Back it off 20%, we're still not, definitely not bottom, bottoming out this or, or help hurting this crop for nitrogen. So in multiple <laughs> trials, we've seen that there's significant potential to reduce nitrogen rates on seed. The benefits of which from our own trials, but also from other people, other, tr other uh, literature, other trials in other places, it's generally associated with higher tuber numbers per plant, higher gravity, Earlier maturation, less use of red glum, you know, earlier skin set, so you can either dig earlier or you're more confident when you dig, you're not gonna get into uh, skinning. Especially on some of these newer varieties that are a little more susceptible to fusarium, like mountain gems and uh, clear waters and payettes and some of these other ones. If we can have, make sure we have nice, healthy, thick skins on them before we dig them, we're a lot less likely to have fusarium spread. And then, of course, we get into the environmental side. We talked two weeks ago here about residual nitrogen in nitrates and nitrous oxide. If we leave less nitrogen in the ground, it's less stuff to be worried about. And then, of course, just the lower fertilizer cost. How much is that fertilizer worth? Nitrogen still costs a lot more than it used to, so if we can cut some of that cost, that's a benefit as well. But of course, this, uh, these recommendations are going to vary by variety and with the preceding crop. I'm not going to go too much of this because Newton already talked about this a lot, but I wanted to show you, this is just a cool slide I got from Mark Pavig in Washington. This is half an ounce, three quarters of an ounce, an ounce, one and a half, or one and a quarter, one and a half, two, two and a half, three, three and a half. And you can see that basically anything below two, we're dealing with skips, we're dealing with non-emergence, and we're dealing with wimpier plants. And as we get two and above, we got some very nice healthy plants. And you can see that replicated as he goes along here, right? So there, rep there definitely is a benefit to having stronger seed pieces. And this stuff down here, we need to not be planting at all because even if it does emerge and even if it does grow, it's going to be less viable and it's going to have a hard time paying for itself. 
this was just some work we did at um, Harrington with Dave Main, and we were able to show that there was a statistical difference in the number of stems per plant, which would also translate to the number of tubers per plant when we increased the, the, uh, the size. And um, when we look at yields, we definitely saw a, an upward trend on, mar on total yield. You see the marketable yields are a little tighter, and I think, and that's because you see the amount of smalls increases and the amount of 10 ounce decreases. Again, as we have, excuse me, as we have larger seed pieces, we have to also look at adjusting the spacing. So it's, you know, if you're going from a, an average size of 2.2 and you're going up to 2.5 on a variety of years when you're cutting seed, you're going to have to manage the spacing, same as if you're going the other way. So this is the stuff you don't want to be planting, you know? And how do we make less of this stuff, hopefully? Um, by, ha by having to cut less seed in the first place. So how do we have more stuff that's seven ounce and down that we only have to either cut once or not cut at all? And then hopefully have a more even uh, uh, amount of seed going, through the, uh, going into the field. Because the more even the seed is in terms of consistent size, the more even your emergence will be. Um, I had, there's a fact sheet on the website from a few years ago in terms of managing uh, seed handling. It goes into seed cutter maintenance, it goes into seed sizing, it goes into disinfection, it talks about a lot of these types of things. So I'm not going to belabor that. You've probably already read it. If you want a refresher, it's on there. If you want to provide it to any of your staff, it's on there. It's a good refresher ahead of seed cutting season. One of the really big things is we, how do we have more and more farms doing stuff like this and having the end of the bin piler be right on the face of the pile as you're loading that seed and then reduce those drops as much as possible because reducing those drops you know even six inches on a cut side will bruise that seed almost a hundred percent of the time so how do we how do, if it's hitting a hard surface so how do we try and minimize these heights here's one uh, i don't know if i can uh i might have to yeah. Oh, I have to press the button. I have a video. So there's an old bin piler that was retrofitted with an optical eye um, to again, so that you didn't have to have somebody uh, sitting on the end of this bin piler all the time to make sure that the height's adjusted. You just got an optical eye up here that's automatically raising this bin piler and making sure that we're minimizing those drop heights. So, you know, there, there are multiple ways around this in terms of trying to decrease our, you know, decrease our, our heights while not tying up an extra person, that sort of thing. There's technical ways around this. If you don't want to go spend hundred grand on a new bin piler or whatever bin piler's cost. And uh, set cutter disinfection. So we talked a little bit about black leg and some of these other diseases that are spread through cutting. Um, we had a few growers that were getting into big problems with black leg on certain varieties and they wanted to look at how do we manage that. So this is a system that sprays directly onto the knives, sprays down onto the knives from the top and inside directly onto the knives. They have it timed for about every four minutes and it's not a huge volume of water but it's enough to coat those knives and keep them clean. And the growers that are doing this have been telling me that anecdotally they are seeing less black light spread after having this type of equipment. And this is not a real expensive system to set up. One grower told me last year it was about $1,500 for the equipment and $600 for the installation or something like that. So, you know, we're talking two or three grand probably. So there's a few cutters in PEI set up like this now. So just, you know, helpful hints around seed cutter maintenance. Make sure your rollers are spaced properly particularly taking into effect into account the size of your seed lot and adjusting those flow volumes so that you know you've got the nice even flow of potatoes they're not bunching up and hopping over each other and they're not crowding into the into the knives so that you're getting them between knives and things like that um, but also making sure you're getting enough volume to get your seed cut you know in a reasonably quick fashion as um, both grow or both uh, presenters talked about keeping those knives sharp to have those nice clean edges on the cuts um, your horizontal knife, I know some varieties we don't even have to use the horizontal knife, but if you are making sure that it's spaced properly so you're not cutting two-thirds, one-third down those uh, potatoes, uh, make sure that it's, it's at the right uh, level. And opening up that chip, chip eliminator to get rid of those 
tiny pieces that you know you don't they don't they're not going to be profitable for you and frequently taking samples of your seed profile to make adjustments as necessary and make sure you're getting the right distribution I, I talked about this analogy yesterday if I have you know if I'm cutting my seed and I'm my aim for 2.4 and Lorraine's cutting her seed and she's aiming for 2.4 but my distribution is 1.5 to 4 and Lorraine's is 2 to 3 with the same average but her seed lot's going to be a lot more consistent. It's going to be a lot more even emergence. You're not going to have those chip, you know, ones at the bottom that are going to be more problematic, and it's probably going to generate less chips. So again, making sure you can keep your distribution as tight as possible um, is more important than necessarily your average number. So those are just some of the general BMPs. We've, most of the people have talked about these already, so uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on